My guest today is an entrepreneur, a business leader, and a world explorer. After reading Tim Ferriss' book, The 4-Hour Workweek, he moved with his family from Toronto to Costa Rica, from where he now runs US-based FastCloud, a consulting and systems implementation company, partner of Salesforce, Monday, and Tableau, with clients in 27 countries and consultants in 12. He's also a huge fan of everything blockchain. We're going to get into that. He's the chapter president of the Entrepreneurs Organization in Costa Rica, and he's been a member of YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And during the pandemic, he launched Blockchain Guard, a distributor of crypto security equipment, such as hard wallets and CryptoNet Academy, specialized in helping people around the world learn how to get into the Web3 world. He's quite involved as an angel investor and has currently created positions in Web3 related companies such as CoinList, OpenSea, Epic Games, and others. Please join me in welcoming Rogelio Martinez. Rogelio, welcome to the show. Thanks, Annie. I'm glad to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. Let's start with the big one, which is I've always wondered why Canadians choose to continue to live in Canada, given the, uh, you know, 11 months of winter. And I see that you very intelligently made a decision to move to paradise, Costa Rica. Everyone seems to be moving there. Tell us about that move. Like what inspired it? Usually when there's such a big life transformation, transition that happens, there's a lot more behind it than just a move. So I'd love to start there. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. Uh, you mentioned I was reading this book before our work week. Before reading the book, well, I work for s some companies there like eight to six, eight to seven every day, driving 15 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes to go to my job. I was living in downtown Toronto and sometimes I have to drive to Mississauga or people familiar with the GTA. And then I started reading this book before our work week. I think don't remember the book was launched probably in 2006 or 2009, but I got it in 2010. And there, there were two things that marked what I was reading. One, it's about people working all their lives. So when they retire, they finally do all these amazing things they always wanted to do. But sometimes when they retire, they just don't have the health or the money or something just in the middle and they never do what they always wanted to do and the dream. So Tim says, do today everything you want to do. Don't wait for retirement. So that made a lot of sense for me. And the other part, the second main point is that people, when they graduate or undergrad or whatever, and they get the first job, or perhaps they start their first business, they take that job or business and then the entire person alive gets grabbed and accommodated around that job or that business. And then I call it a carrot. Probably Tim doesn't mention the carrot in the book, but then you get another carrot and you jump and you get this, the next carrot. And then again, all your personal lives, life gets dropped around that new carrot. So your life is always accommodated in the job. But he says, no, think about the life you want, a life by design, and then grab your job around that life that you want or the business. So it made a lot of sense so much that just four months after reading the book, I was already living in Costa Rica and I sold everything in Toronto and I never went back. So I'm very happy from Costa Rica running my ventures, but uh, living the life I wanted, playing golf. When I got here, I played golf every morning, six times a week. That's crazy. Diving, volcanoes, nature, beach, living the life I always wanted. So what was the hardest part about and just to be clear, guys, you run a couple of companies from your laptop and with your dog, working on your terrace, sitting in the sun in Costa Rica. What's been the hardest part of becoming an entrepreneur and reaching that first milestone of success? There are a few things, Annie, that came to my mind during when you were praising the question. First, I was not, I did not start my career as an entrepreneur. I built my career in the corporate world. And up until 2016, I was a full-time employee, probably with some smaller ventures, like I had a restaurant in Toronto and a few other things. But the most difficult part for me was 
transitioning from a very successful corporate executive to the entrepreneurship because until 2016, I was president of Berlitz Franchising Corporation. Berlitz is like 140 plus year old business. I was running in 52 countries and based in Princeton, New Jersey. And by the way, that story, I was already living in Costa Rica and then I got that job. So I had to move to Princeton and I told the company, Nops, at the end, I'm not accepting this offer. But then we started negotiating and we got into, okay, one week in Costa Rica, one week in Princeton. So I was commuting on a direct flight to Newark on Sundays, uh, working until Friday, I think Friday evening, coming back from, from Princeton in Jersey to Costa Rica, but going back to the transition. So when I stopped working at Berlitz and wanted to become an entrepreneur, the most difficult part for me was the ego that I had to overcome because before I was the president of this huge company. I even remember my very first day at Berlitz, I was invited to have a dean with a group of people and Bill Clinton. That was really awesome. And I had been interviewed by Bloomberg and CNN, a celebrity in corporate world, conquering all these paradigms that we have. And all of a sudden it was just me. No interviews, no tie, no big building, no corporate expenses. No, it was just me starting from zero, building a dream. But it was not anymore that image of this successful corporate sector. It was Rogelio building something from scratch with his laptop and his dog and his terrace. So I had to go through this change in who I really was. I felt that all of a sudden I was no one because I was not the president of this huge company. I think that was the most difficult part. It took me several months and at that time, from Berlitz to my transition at the time in Berlitz, I was at the YPO. So I had people, very successful peers there, but I had a few peers that had already sold their business and they went through the same as I was experiencing. Like I'm not the, now the owner of, I'm like the guy probably with a lot of money in the bank, but that's a lot of it for some of my colleagues interiorizing that it was not the job that I had or the business that I represented. But the collection of experiences that created the essence of who I was. And today, it's very easy to say, but to believe that is the difficult part. So it took me a while and slowly I was able to be very comfortable with whom I was and the business I was. And another thing is about how people typically measure success because a lot of people measure success with the money you have in the bank or the money you make every month. Because it's very easy. Money, you check out in balance and okay, there you go. But happiness or satisfaction, you can't say, oh, I just made three units of happiness this morning. You can't really measure that. So trying to have a way of measuring this success, not only on the monetary, of course, it's important. I get it. Yeah, I live comfortable, have places, etc. But it was not the only dimension I had to focus. The dimension of having quality time with my kids. The dimension of having not working Saturday and Sunday almost full term and building, building again, the life by design. It was, it was difficult, it, but today I believe in who I am as my collection of experiences and not the title that I have. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, today is Friday. I spent, we started recording at 1 PM central time and I spent the entire day at the gym, moving my body and stretching and I sat in the sauna for an hour. I went into the cold plunge and talked to a client on the phone. It's having the ability to do what we want when we want and really take care of ourselves and do the things that feel meaningful. I think that feels so much more memorable and impactful than the amount of money. I think building a business around our life and around the things that matter to us around our core values is so much more sustainable than building a business first, having no boundaries, giving it everything and sacrificing all the things that matter and giving ourselves, our family, our health, the scraps. It can lead to short-term success, but over the long term, most people who follow that, that boss end up pretty miserable. And it's funny because I had another EO 
member, Tim Vogel, who actually ran the accelerator program. He was on the show a few days ago and he said the same thing, right? The life by design. And he moved from DC to Florida and this idea of being intentional at in a longer term time horizon is really such a superpower. But one of the things that I see that really differentiates the entrepreneurs who are very successful and the ones who struggle is that the more successful ones, they operate at a much longer time horizon. They're looking at things a decade ahead, two decades, three decades ahead and thinking, okay, how do I want this to look? Where do I want to be? How do I want to feel? What choices do I need to make today that will put me on that track? Whereas the people who are stuck in the short-term survival mindset, they're thinking at a year-long horizon or a month-long or even a week-long. Some people take it day by day, and that's a pretty crazy way to live. So what was that journey for you of getting to Costa Rica, navigating that whole identity crisis, going from someone to no one, having an army of people that reported to you, news outlets, just so much prestige to going to just being you while you and dogs important. It's such a core, core joy in life relationship with animals. So what was the journey like to start Fast Cloud? Was it instant success? Was it a long, hard, arduous journey? What was that like? Salesforce, I, a bit of background. I did work in technology in the past, but in the, from the sales side, I worked for SAP selling DRP. I worked for Oracle selling ERP. So I was not alien to technology, but I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I can't read a line of code. So all of a sudden I was starting a software company. Right? So, right? so I really had to study a lot. I remember the first probably five months, I would study probably six hours a day getting Salesforce certifications, not the ones you need code to do them, but the ones that are in the, in this tech world, you call it a functional or declarative development, which is more drag and drop and automations and things like that. So I could understand what we had to do when building projects. I was very good at selling the projects, but then we had to build them. I was very limited on the amount of money that I wanted to invest. At home, we made an agreement, my wife and I, that we couldn't jeopardize a lot of the family capital. It was, I was going to give myself a two-year opportunity to see if I could create a startup successful without putting at risk the family assets. So we did that. I started the business with $20,000 only. <laughs> The agreed limit, right? Very low amount. And I started hiring first with a very limited budget, pretty much students or people that didn't have a lot of strong experience. They and Salesforce gave me the opportunity through Trailhead to train my my first employee was a student of second semester of software engineer. And we started like that. But quickly we found that Salesforce gives you a very easy path. It's like having a franchise, actually. All the resources that Salesforce give you is like having a franchise. So we started bringing projects. And once we had secured the product, one of my first projects was actually with Sandler Sales Training, the sales franchise. So, so I, I was automating the Sandler process in the CRM that was really cool. So it was something I felt very comfortable with. So I started positioning projects in industries. I could actually add a lot of value. Mm. And we started growing quite fast. We were growing probably about 80% the first year, 80% the second year. And the, but one challenge that I had is talent. In technology, it's difficult to find talent. But now in Salesforce, it's even more difficult to find talent. So one of the things I learned back in 2001 to 2006, when I worked at WSI, an internet franchise at the time, now at WSI is a bit different, but we became the fourth fastest growing franchise in the world. And we developed franchises in more than a hundred countries. So I learned in, in, in those bases right after my MBA that the world was my playground. There are no borders for what I do in any company I have worked with. For me, if I'm negotiating in Nigeria or Singapore or Argentina, it's just one more negotiation, one more market I'm conquering. It's like being in Austin and saying, okay, I'm now expanding to California. I could be in Costa Rica with my with a Miami-based company, and I might be expanding to Chile or England. It's, it's, I don't have mental borders. 
So the world became my playground. And I have done that in most companies I have worked with. I have expanded comfort markets. So in Tallinn, I started doing the same. I couldn't find people in my home market. I just started looking for people through LinkedIn on anywhere I could find the people that I needed for the projects. Back in the day, when I started this company, we had no COVID. So remote work was not typical. Actually, in 2010, when I was working at Tudor Doctor franchise based in Toronto, I became the very first employee not working in Toronto, not working at the office. So I've been working remote since 2010. Berlitz, well, one every other week, but still half of the time working remote. That gave me the possibility to find best people with the right talent at the right wage. So that was very key for the success of my growth because in Salesforce, it's not about not finding clients. It's about finding the people that can implement your projects. That's really interesting. One of the frameworks I use to grow companies exponentially is getting the founder focused on the business's number one constraint. And one of the problems that I see entrepreneurs get into over and over again that causes them to struggle is that they try to solve problems in the wrong order. And so a couple of things that I want to pull out from what you just shared. One, it's a very intelligent move to use the past experience that you have to define the business you want to start because you already had domain expertise, even though you had to learn a lot. And you actually, that's another thing, you actually put in the down payment to develop and acquire the domain expertise in terms of Salesforce and technology. But you had familiarity with the space. And the key constraint in the space was not acquisition of customers but it was actually in the fulfillment and delivery. And there's so many businesses that are struggling because they're struggling to acquire customers and they spend all their time trying to figure that out. And it's really interesting to see that there are markets in which there's actually an overflow of supply of customers and the real constraint in the business is actually in the delivery. Yeah. Just to follow up on that line of thought, this no, this borderless operating method, it gave me to, it, it resulted in today we have clients in 27 countries, three continents. So this is, I still consider this business a startup. We started in 2016, 27 countries and my consultants are based in 12 countries. Wow. And anything you want to share in terms of the growth rate or where you guys are at revenue wise? Yeah. So when I started the company, we were growing well in 80% year on year and first year of COVID, 119% quickly became, got into the millions in revenue. But one thing that I, I have failed, this is a, a failure, is I started this business mostly to create products. I wanted to be a SaaS company and I became a very strong consulting and implementation company and getting like scaling up methodology and et cetera. And they talk about, I have taken some training on product focused company, recurrent revenue, AIR and all those things. But still, I was getting so much into the day to day that I was drowning with a new more project and one more project that my dream of product company was not materializing. So for several years at the beginning, that wasn't my biggest failure. As I, we were saying, I was bringing the expertise, but one very strong expertise apart from technology is franchising. Because in most companies I've worked in the past are with either franchise companies, Berlitz is a language academy franchise, actually the oldest operating franchise in the world, franchising since 1889. So I was very proud of that. Wow. So franchises or technology franchises, like totally aside. So in 2001, when I was doing my MBA at the University of Montreal, I remember I read about Warren Buffett, investing what you know best. And I was going to invest my life. So I wanted to invest in what I knew best, technology and franchise. So finally, we launched our product company, SaaS product in the company called FranceFast, TransFast.io which is a franchise management suite that put together everything I knew best, technology and franchise to help franchisors 
So now I'm coming, coming out of my failure of not focusing on what I really wanted, which was the product based company. And we are focusing more on, on this part of the business and slowly I'm shifting the business, but now it's not as easy as if I would have done the right thing since the beginning, but there is this concept of the path of least resistance. So I just grew the company at one point. I had the vision. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew it was in technology and I had the vision of a product-based company, but then I just got so many implementation opportunities that I, my business started growing on the path of the resistance. And sometimes I feel, so what should I do? Should I just continue growing on the way the market is asking me to grow path of least resistance or grow on the areas I really want to grow? And that was always a question, right? And most recently I have been moving towards building products. Now soon blockchain guard, my other vendor, we will be launching product, a SaaS a product that will help companies from around the world managing all these blockchain transactions and NFTs and all that, because I know my future is on the SaaS, which is what I wanted to do since 2016. But it has not been bad. The consulting and implementation is going fantastic, but it was not why I really started the business. So I want to acknowledge you for being so self-aware. And this is, it's a very strange problem to have because a lot of entrepreneurs would kill for this problem, right? Because most consulting implementation solutions companies, they're looking for more projects. And when there is so much ease to acquire customers and do more projects, and as you described, it's the path of least resistance, turning away business, saying no to, to more business and more projects to narrow the business down into one use case or one problem or one product, it's a very challenging thing. And it's a champagne problem. I have too many inbound requests coming in for diversity of projects and use cases, but for me to truly scale, because scaling a professional services company is very different than scaling a product company. Because professional services, you need to add labor-based leverage to make the arbitrage between what you know, you're paying the developer and what you're billing the customer. But for a product-based company, the potential revenue scales less or more independently than the cost. So the growth can be exponential while the increase in the cost basis is linear. And that's what typically allows for a much bigger exit multiple. That's what allows for a more explosive hockey stick growth rate. So given that you're basically sitting right on the fence of both, now has the product company outpaced the professional services company in terms of revenue, how would you contrast these two types of businesses in terms of how easy or challenging has it been to run them, to grow them, the potential that you see, what do you enjoy more? And how are you thinking about that? Yeah. So this year, something not unexpected started to emerge in my company, which was just, just an opportunity while we're focusing on, on the product based vision. We had some, a practice of support for existing customers or customers that had Salesforce, but needed support. And we created a division on support services. And that division is probably, it has probably grown almost as fast as the product business. Consulting this year is stabilizing in, in, in COVID times, it grew quite a lot. Consulting because people started to see that they needed a lot of solutions for managing their clientele, most especially a customer service, multi-channel. We had a lot of projects in that area during COVID. Now it's stabilizing consulting, but support is growing dramatically. And we had to put together some great automated processes to maintain visibility and SLAs. But on the product side, we launched version 2.0 of FriendFast this year and we are going to be exhibiting on at the IFA convention in Las Vegas at the beginning of next year. 
that's where we are going to prepare our big launch of version two. But, I, but one important aspect is on the blockchain product that we also want. Now, going more into the details on the differences, consulting, you sell a project, you deliver the project, and you probably have no additional revenue after you deliver the project, unless phase two or unless support. But at several times, you deliver the project, thank you very much, and it will be attentive to any new requirement. And you need a lot of people. And people in technology to bring and retain is not easy. A lot of people like consulting, think that it's very intellectually challenging having a consulting business. Since my undergrad graduation, I really wanted to have a consulting job somewhere like the top of McKenzie's. And I really, I was really attracted about that because I feel that you learn a lot intellectually and very attracted to consulting, learning, solving problems in product. It's very comfortable because you acquire clients and as long as you have some good customer service and you evolve the product with enhancement based on what the industry needs, you are probably going to be retaining and renewing your customers year after year. And if they are successful with your, with your product, they will probably be adding more and more users. So if you sell not platform price, but by the user, which most SaaS companies do, it's going to be a very huge exponential factor that with very few people, you can maintain a huge amount of clients. And it's probably, I don't, I'm not sure, 2005, a, a lot of companies have been moving to subscription-based, the Spotify's of the world, it's the Netflix of the world, getting the old revenue stream of the phone company, right? Every month you pay your, or your phone line, if you still have a phone line at home, now it's a cell phone. Pro, a subscription based is very powerful for the growth of the business without requiring the same amount of people growing in parallel, the subscription base that you have. I'm really attracted to, to continue building on that part. So the idea is to over time transition fully to the product business, or would you still keep the the consulting business alive because it's easy and there's constant demand. Okay. So today I might have 70% consulting. Let's say I'm just going to put support and consulting on yeah. the same area because support is mostly for the consulting projects. So probably 70 to 75% is consulting and 25%, let's say 30% is SaaS right now. I would like SaaS to be 80% of a business and consulting 20% of a business. Amazing. And do you have operators running these divisions or do you do it all yourself, including blockchain guard or how does, how does this work? How do you parallel process across so many? So for what I'm going to talk about, scaling up the Vern Harnish book was key at helping me understand how to lay the layers of management in my business until probably the beginning of this year. And of course, the EO forums, my peers from EO, I was at the forum at US Central chapter where all the EO members were in technology. So they were really awesome. And then my EO members from Costa Rica, I was not in the Columbia chapter at that time. Plus the knowledge from scaling up and the retreats and all that, the EO, YPO people know what I'm talking about. So the, I made the commitment that I had to free myself from the day to day. Actually, I, there was a, a, an important piece. I was doing EO IPAD in Mexico City in there. And I, the very first article was Michael Porter G versus operational efficiencies. And he said that. The founder can't be focused on operational efficiencies like fine tuning here and there because you don't see where the business is going. You need to be removed from the operational efficiencies, get the right people to do that, but look at strategy. Where is business going? So that plus scaling up layers of management and all that, I made the commitment with my EO forum in, in, in the retreat. Guys, 30 days, I want to get a general manager who will run my business. So I will focus on the strategy. So less than 30 days. So that day I called the person I had in mind. I told her, Yvonne, I told her, Yvonne, this is the opportunity. Are, do you like it? Yes, I like it. Like three weeks after she was already reaching out my, my business. She's awesome. She runs most of my operations at FastCloud. So that gave me the time 
to start focusing on a passion that I developed when pandemic started. Actually, not pandemic, second year, uh, around February. I will go to that story later. So I started focusing more on my new passions, NFT, blockchain. I became an international speaker on NFTs, metaverse, blockchain. I go to the Middle East, South America, North America, Caribbean, talking about how businesses are getting impacted by this Web3 and how the world is changing. And it also allowed me to launch two new business mentors, which is Blockchain Art and CryptoNet Academy. CryptoNet Academy helps people educate and advisory. And Blockchain Art is a distribution I mentioned at the beginning, CryptoNet, uh, crypto security equipment. But it's because I separated from the day to day. I, I had a clear vision on how to lay the management layers through, thanks to scaling up. I had the vision of strategy versus operational efficiencies. Thank you, Mike Porter and Anio we patted. And having the right people, because back in the day, I'm going to go to a meeting I had with some Salesforce partners, SaaS products, and there was something key. Hire the right person since the beginning. And now there is this very famous phrase is, Hire slow and fire fast, right? So hire the right people. At the beginning, I was not really hiring the right people in my business. I was hiring people I could afford, that I thought I could afford with cash that I had right there. But those decisions became very costly if they were not the right people. Probably I would save that one month, some in salaries, but then the project, instead of finishing in three months, would finish probably in five months. So that would become a lot more expensive than hiring the right people, even if they were more expensive or more difficult to attract or whatever. Hire the right people since the beginning. And remember this again, hire slow, fire fast. <laughs> but I ramble a little bit, Danny. Sorry, I don't know if I gave you the answer you wanted. No, you, you, you articulated it really beautifully because... So a couple of things, right? I see this a lot. One of the biggest blocks to scaling is that the founder is the main bottleneck. And the founder has to let go of control, which is hard for a lot of founders. But we all, the founders also need someone to let go of control too. And typically for a business to scale past seven figures, multiple seven figures, especially seven to eight and eight plus, there needs to be a leadership team of some sort. And even to get to seven, multiple seven figures and the founder to not feel like shooting themselves in the face, the founder needs an operational counterpart, an operator who can be play integrator, who can make sure things are getting done, projects are being managed, maybe some people management as well. And this is a very, very challenging thing for most founders. It's typically a hire they need to make before they have the capital because they're not doing the levels of revenue they'll be able to in a few months or in a year with that person on board. So they have to step into that identity of that next level and start making decisions from that place well before they actually get. And this is why at Scale with Psychology, one of the pillars of the methodology we use is to up-level the founder's identity. And they have to be thinking at the seven-figure identity when they're at six figures. And they have to be thinking at the eight-figure identity when they're at seven figures because they have to make decisions from that next level now. Because if they don't, they'll keep circling the level that they're at right now. So that's one thing that I want to pull out for everyone listening in what you said. You felt the discomfort and you had your own process navigating it, but you really were able to free up time capacity to build the blockchain businesses, which really spoke to your passions. But also it's very smart because it's a huge, huge market opportunity and your timing's impeccable. You wouldn't have been able to do that if you were basically used up completely and maxed out in the primary business. And the second thing is, even for that primary business to grow, your attention was required to be on strategy and on vision. And that's another 
thing that I see that stops most entrepreneurs from scaling their businesses fast because they're so involved in the operations that there is no capacity left. There is no time and space left to actually think ahead and elevate above the business. And it's like going to the roof of the Empire State Building and seeing for miles away and being able to have that perspective and know where to navigate the team, know where to navigate the business. And so this is really powerful for anyone who's listening, who's maybe stuck at a certain revenue level, who's maybe feeling a little overwhelmed because there's no capacity left, there's no bandwidth left, and they're feeling a little stretched and the business is feeling stuck. It's typically because either the founder is a bottleneck and is holding on to certain operational roles and responsibilities, or they haven't brought in the right person who can take over those things. And they're definitely not spending enough time on the strategy, on the vision, on charting a course that they can then communicate as the vision to the entire team. So this feels like a good place to segue into the blockchain space. Tell us a little bit about why you chose and this is, again, a testament to your intelligence, because there's an old saying that in the California gold rush, the people who got the richest were the ones selling shovel. You've demonstrated this actually consistently because Faust Cloud, you're capitalizing on a network effect that's already taking place. The reason why you never had to hunt for customers is because Salesforce created your customer and Salesforce also created the problem that for your customers that you just had to step inside and say, hey, I can solve your problem. And you literally had an unlimited supply of customers, right? Very intelligent. And you pick a gold rush, essentially, that Salesforce created, and you essentially sold shovels to them in the form of those projects and those solutions, whether it's customer service or whatever. Yeah, You've done the same thing at the blockchain. So I'm really curious and I want to highlight that thinking for anyone listening because at the highest level is the market or the industry. And then the next level is the vehicle that the business represents, right? What kind of solution you're providing in that market or industry. And then it's what is your offer? What is your product and how are you fulfilling it? But the higher up you go, the bigger impact and difference it makes to how successful the company is going to be. And you've selected an industry that's exploding, growing would be an understatement. You've selected a problem set, which is quite intelligent. And so talk us through how you made that decision. What is, like, what do you see in those businesses as potential for explosive growth? That's good, Annie. So everything has started because I had a problem with my fitness center. <laughs> so I used to go to a cold gym nearby, pandemic hit. I couldn't go to the gym anymore. So I had a problem. I had to do sports. So what can I do at home that would make me not feel that is taking time from my business and my family? And I ended up deciding to get a concept to rowing machine. I did my research, concept to fantastic. I do half an hour rowing I and mean, it works, everything. But then I started doing rowing and it was very noisy. So I said, okay, I don't like this noise. Rowing is quite boring. So I said, I'm going to start listening to some podcasts. So I looked for the Tim Ferriss podcast, of course. And then he brought a guest. And that guest was Kevin Rose, the legendary founder of, not Reddit, the yeah. IGG. Yeah. So he had at that time, modern finance, but finance podcast, it was about decentralized finance and stuff like that. But then he started changing the topic of his podcast. He became more interested in NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And that was probably when I started listening to the podcast, it was probably February of 2021 by, I don't remember exactly, but truth, the podcast that he founded for NFT oriented was probably built in June. And I loved how all this technology was changing and was going to change 
so many things in our world because you know web three is just the evolution of the internet. It's like when we had no internet, no internet to have an internet. So I feel that we are going from having a very old internet to having the next thing. And the adoption of these technologies, blockchain, Bitcoin, DeFi, Metaverse, is growing. I heard the other day this, the adoption is going faster than any other technology ever. And there are so many things being changed behind the scenes. I'm an insider. I really see everything that is happening every day. It, one, one month in, in Web3 is like one year, three years, somewhere else. Incredible. So in one of uh, Kevin Rowe's podcasts, he mentioned at the very end, oh, and, and we are going to have this proof membership released like in two days. But I never heard about it because he didn't do any marketing. He barely mentioned at one of the podcasts. I could go, I go, oh, I had to have one of these memberships. So I got my proof membership. It's a very interesting community of a thousand people, top collectors, top artists. And that's when I really got to understand from the source. Everything that has, was being developed, like the top developers, the top artists, the guys there, the community is fantastic. So I couldn't resist not only being a collector and an expectator, I wanted to be part of this revolution. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of the people that are changing the world today. So I decided to, first I became speaker. I started evangelizing all these changes around the world. And then I decided to create blockchain cards. I, I'm not a developer. I can't read code. I was desperate. Like, I wish I could program all these things, smart contracts and all that. But I did the same as I did at Pasto. I just got the people that can do all the wonder, right? All the magic. I put the direction, but I have fantastic people in these companies. So now we are really thrilled on what we are building in terms of helping companies around the world manage their collections, their transactions, their customer base built on integration with blockchain. It's I, I can't do a lot of details right now on the technology we're using and all those things, but I'm really excited about this. Hopefully by around February, we can launch the product. And the, I became a metaverse investor and I know I own other deal for other side and Sandbox and Decentraline. I'm very excited about what this is going to bring to the world and is bringing to the world. Yes, we are in a bear market. Yes, you, Bitcoin price went down, but it has happened in the past. It went down, it's a cycle, and we call it in industry. In, during the bear market, you build. That's what I'm doing today. I am building. Yeah, plus everything's on sale, so. Yeah. So good opportunity to pick up some coin at discount. Exactly. What do you see as the evolution of the blockchain space in the short term? Like in the next two, three years, yes, as you said, right now we're in the bear, in a bear market and the macroeconomic conditions are not very conducive for that to change anytime soon. Pretty much every, every asset is going through a bear market and we're in a stagnationary condition. How do you see the blockchain space evolving? And what yeah. are you seeing as an insider in terms of the projects that people are building, how stuff is getting conceived? Yeah. So one very interesting thing about this bear market is that today companies still have money and VCs and angel investors, we are still investing. Now, the last time there was the, the ICO, the initial coin offering went down, everybody ran out of money, projects had no capital, no cash, no one investing. This time is quite Different. We see a lot of movement in investment going towards the industry, even though it's bear market. There are a lot of great development teams building decentralized finance, building utility for NFTs, for direct business applications, reservations. Shopify launched NFT gated e commerce to differentiate the customer base, VIP customers, wholesale pricing. Like there are so many things. And this is not a stopping. We might be working a lot of things behind the scenes. But this is not stopping. The bear market, again, is for builders. We are building. And I see that within two and a half years, more or less, we will see incredible applications all over the place. I'm quite in, in, I invested now in, in decentralized finance, in DeFi. That's incredible. 
Like you can do a lot of things, loans, a lot of things without the conventional banks in the middle. It's fantastic how things are changing. And definitely if there is someone looking for a changing career, even if you don't have the skills to develop a smart contract and solidity language and all that, you can start very easy. Just Discord moderator. There, there is scarcity on Discord moderators because all these technologies they build on Discord, they connect on Discord. I always tell you, you want to be in base, involved in Web3, just learn how to use Discord and apply for Discord moderator and then you will get the understanding and then you will start seeing a lot of opportunities. But that's one of the easiest parts, the easiest entries on, on, on in this world. You've done a lot of very intelligent things. You've made a lot of intelligent choices. And I always tell entrepreneurs that their life and business is a reflection of the choices that they've made. The sum total of all the decisions. And the quality of someone's thinking is what allows for the decision-making to be either high quality that generates a big return on time and effort or low quality. And it creates a lot of stress and suffering and marginal lift in terms of ROI. You've definitely had the self-awareness to understand markets, products, spaces, domains that you understand and hyper-focus on those and use that as an unfair advantage. You've been able to spot problems such as the talent gap, right? overabundance of supply in the Salesforce ecosystem and not enough talented developers who can build solutions to meet that demand. And you've built capabilities like the ability to harvest talent in a borderless way, first for Salesforce and the consulting company, but it seems you've been able to replicate that in the blockchain space. And without having any technical abilities or the ability to read or write smart contracts or white papers, you haven't let that limit you You've actually leveraged that skill that you've developed of finding developers and then aggregated those people to leverage them towards building a certain use case and use that to build companies. If I was to ask you to look back at the past 10 years and introspect about things that, things that you made that were counterproductive or mistakes that you made or things that you wish you would have done differently, are there any one or two things that if you had done differently could have led to a wildly asymmetric outcome? Okay. So I can think of one thing, but first I'm going to tell you a bit about the philosophy on how I see life shortly, in short. So the, a, a question is like, what regrets do you have, right? What have, would have done differently in, in the past? And it is difficult for me to find one. I'm very satisfied with the place I am today and the collection of choices I have made in my life are the ones that took me here. I'm very proud of my family, very proud of my team in the company, very proud of my achievements, but with all, without all the failures I have had in the, in, in the past, I wouldn't be here. So it's difficult to say one, I should have done this or that. I can give you probably one that would probably resonate the most, but it's probably not the one specific one you would like to hear or the audience. It would be having started as an entrepreneur earlier in my life. Mm -hmm. That would be the only one. I really enjoy this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's knowing that the struggle and the challenge that you experience going from employee to entrepreneur. And it's interesting, right? You get to the other side of that challenge and you realize, wow, I should have done this a little bit sooner. Cool. So let's look ahead, right? How do you, what's your sense of what it would take to 10X from here? First, what do you want to 10X and what would that look like? Okay. Clarification in there, Annie. 10X in terms of revenue or 10X in terms of valuations, which are different. <laughs> We, what would be the more meaningful metric for you? Okay. So I do have an exit strategy. I am not completely sure if I would change my mind later on, but since long time ago, I like to think on 10 year chunks 
I, I applied for 10 years and my planning was for me to retire at 50. I would probably be doing some coaching or some advising or some podcasts, et cetera, but not having a business to run by 50. So I need to get to a very high valuation by the time I'm 50 or so. And I think that the SaaS based company, especially on the blockchain part, would easily take me to way beyond 10 X. I think we're talking about a hundred X stuff like that. And that, because it's a very fast growing, very highly valued industry and an industry that needs a lot of things today. So those, the combination of these three things will most likely tell me my objective is to be a hundred X and by the time or before I am actually before I'm 50. So for the blockchain part, I think that we can get there in the next year and a half or year or so, max two years. And it's because of this SaaS based company in a very hot, very high growth, high, ultra high net, ultra high growth opportunity that we have that every, everybody has, because now you don't need to be in Silicon Valley to make it big in web three. Take the opportunity audience. Now you're yeah. doing it from a terrace in Costa Rica. <laughs> exactly. Your side. That's incredible. What's a question as we come close to wrapping up that I haven't asked you that you know, would be very insightful and valuable for listeners. We live most of our lives with fears. We have fear of talking with your wife about something, be fear to talk about the person you like a lot, but you're, you have afraid of saying something, fear of starting a business, fear of talking straight with your boss and tell the things you always wanted to do, fear about quitting, fear about moving, fear about many things. So if we had the focus of living our lives with less fear, can probably say without fear, but with, with less fear or be very conscious about the fears we have, I think we would live a more successful, fulfilling lives. Now talking especially about entrepreneurship, right? Take those bold moves with a calculated risk instead of continue living with your fears. I think that would probably be what I wanted to communicate. It's one of the last thoughts. Amazing. Virgilio, thank you so much for being here. Please let listeners know where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at MetaScoutVC or LinkedIn.com slash IN as international slash Rogelio Martinez, R-O-G-E-L-I-O. M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z. LinkedIn or Twitter are probably the easiest. Beautiful. Guys, please go and follow Rogelio. It was such a pleasure having you and I'm excited to follow your success.